It's very important that as a diocese we gather together periodically to reaffirm our commitment to Jesus Christ and to the living tradition of the church, which we are to proclaim, to celebrate, and to extend our lives and service out into the world. But in order to do that, we need at times to get away. Jesus does that in the Gospels. He goes away by himself, and he takes usually his collaborators with him. So that's what we're doing. Some days of refreshment, days to recommit ourselves to Christ's work, but also to renew our friendships with each other. I always get this sense when I read the scriptures that the core of Jesus' ministry is relationships. His relationship with us, his relationship with those he has redeemed by his precious blood. And he does that out of great love. So we have to be in relationship to one another. We are all co-workers in the vineyard. Each of us has distinct roles, offices that we hold, but we collaborate, we support, we learn from one another. And so it's my pleasure, my joy as your bishop, the privilege I have to uh, serve you in this role of bishop to be with you and be with you these two days. Also, uh, Monsignor Cook is going to uh, give an introduction to Dr. Martin, but I just have to say a few words. We're colleagues from back at Sacred Heart Seminary where we both taught, and what a joy it was to always have him as a co-worker on the faculty. You know, some folks kind of catch what you might call a trend, and then as they say, they ride the wave. There are those, though, who never catch a trend. They don't have to, because what's important to them is Jesus Christ. Long before Dr. Martin came on our faculty, he really had already proclaimed that faith and understood what we call is the new evangelization and began that in Ann Arbor and with the Word of God community. In other words, long before it became fashionable, he was already living it, inviting other disciples to come and begin that work of renewing our relationship with Jesus Christ and with his church. So I know you're going to enjoy him. I know I have, and he's been a wonderful colleague and friend. And so I welcome you, especially Dr. Martin, and who's completed his doctorate and uh, is with us from, I believe, it was the Angelicum in, uh, in Rome. So he not only is uh, one of our professors, but also academically has excelled. But most of all, I'm sure he would say, because he always did to us, the greatest prize is Jesus Christ and life eternal. So welcome, Dr. Ralph, and we're glad that you're here in our diocese to be with us. And Monsignor Cook will give the introductions. Two events from last fall mark this present moment of our Catholic Church in a very clear and significant way. First... On October the 11th, in the year of our Lord 2012, the Church began its celebration of a year of faith in which Pope Benedict XVI invited us to rediscover the journey of faith so as to experience anew the joy and renewed enthusiasm of the encounter with Christ. Second, the world's Catholic bishops convened in Rome this same month for a general synod on the theme of the new evangelization for the transmission of the Christian faith. In their message to the people of God at the conclusion of the synod, the bishops speak of the need to revive a faith that risks eclipse. To address these shifting cultural and social forces which lead so many away from Christ in his gospel, we believers must seek, in the bishop's words, to live our experience of faith in a renewed way and to proclaim it through an evangelization that is new in its ardor, in its methods, and in its expressions, as blessed Pope John Paul II said. 
But many ask, what is this new evangelization? And what are the new methods and expressions that it must take to bring people back to the good news of Jesus Christ? During this year of faith, we gather as priests, deacons, consecrated religious sisters and brothers, and lay faithful to learn more and to take up this invitation to embrace our call to a new evangelization in our own local church of Winona. We welcome two nationally recognized experts and teachers, Dr. Ralph Martin and Mr. Jim Beckman. They will instruct us in understanding both the content of the new evangelization and the witness that it calls us to as individual disciples and as a Catholic community of faith. Dr. Ralph Martin is the president of Renewal Ministries, an organization devoted to Catholic renewal and evangelization. He is also the director of graduate theology programs in the New Evangelization and an associate professor of theology at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Dr. Martin is the author of a number of books, the most recent of which is, Will Many Be Saved? what Vatican II actually teaches and its implications for the new evangelization. This is the book, and they're available over there at, at the table. Dr. Martin holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree from the University of Notre Dame, a Master's of Arts from Sacred Heart Major Seminary, a license in Sacred Theology from the Pontifical Faculty, of the Immaculate Conception at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C., and a doctorate in sacred theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in the city of Rome. In December of 2011, Dr. Martin was appointed by Pope Benedict XVI to a five-year term as a consultor to the Pontifical Council for the New Evangelization. Dr. Martin and his wife, Anne, reside in Ann Arbor, Michigan. The last time that I heard Dr. Martin speak live and in person was at a conference two years ago in August of 2011. It was absolutely inspiring. I took 14 pages of notes. I wrote as fast as I possibly can. It was wonderful, rooted in sacred scripture. I was paging through my Bibles. And I hope that he'll share with you what he shared with us two years ago. He said that the core of evangelization is to be on the lookout to bring people to faith into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's exactly what the bishop just said. It's about relationships. He says that's the core of the new evangelization. He says the evangelization is so important, people's lives depend on it. For what does it profit a man if they have food, clothing, and shelter, but lose their soul in the process? Dr. Martin said to us, we have the real deal. We have Jesus Christ, the path that leads to life. Quoting St. Paul's letter to Timothy, Dr. Martin said, Fan into flame the gift you have received. And so we come to fan into flame the new evangelization. And here to fan that into flame for us is Dr. Ralph Martin. Good morning. I just turned to Bishop Quinn and said, gee, I think Monsignor could give my talk. <laughs> He's such a, a good student, 14 pages of notes. Uh, let's pray, in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of this day, these days, the blessings of being able to take time out from our busy lives and just open our hearts and minds to you, your word, your spirit, and one another. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for not abandoning us and not leaving us orphans. We thank you for not sending out us 
not sending us out on mission and accompanying us. We, Lord, we thank you for being with us always. We thank you for being with us today. We know that you promise wherever two or three gather in your name, you would be there. And Lord, we thank you for your personal presence here today. Amen. Well, we, uh, we certainly miss Bishop Quinn in Michigan, but we're glad that you have him here. And uh, blessed is the diocese that has him as their bishop, and also Bishop Harrington. So, really, yeah. <laughs> it's also great to see Father Jason Kern and Seminarian Jonathan and Father Andy and others that I've had in class at Sacred Heart Major Seminary. So, it's great to see them out in the field or almost to be out in the field. It's really interesting how Bishop Quinn spoke about friendship and how important that is because I was going to start off today with just a few words from Pope Benedict XVI from last year uh, to his uh, fellow cardinals there in Rome. He said, today the word ecclesia militants, church militant, is somewhat out of fashion. But in reality, we can understand ever better that it is true. We see how evil wishes to dominate the world and that it is necessary to enter into battle with evil. We see how it does so in so many ways, bloody ways, but also masked with goodness and precisely this way, destroying the moral foundations of society. We are in this struggle, and in this struggle, it is very important to have friends. And so our, our relationships with each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord, as fellow laborers in the gospel, is part of the strength that the Lord wants to give us for the battle that we are in. Maybe I'll just tell you a little bit more about who I am and what I do, because we are going to be together for a while. Uh, Father Monsignor mentioned Renewal Ministries, and we, we are devoted to Catholic renewal and evangelization. We do this in a lot of different ways. We currently actually have three TV programs going on EWTN right now. We have the longest running Catholic television program called The Choices We Face, and that's on a Tuesday evening at 6.30 Eastern time. I'll convert to Central, right? 5.30 Central, 5.30 Friday morning. And then uh, Scott Hahn and myself are doing a series together now on the new evangelization. It's on 4 o'clock Sunday afternoon, 8 o'clock Monday evening, and 9 o'clock Friday evening. And then our director of missions, uh, Peter Herbeck, is doing uh, the Crossing the Goal television program, which is geared towards Catholic men, uh, also on EWTN. And we have two daily Catholic radio programs, Food for the Journey with Sister Ann Shields and Fire on the Earth with Peter Herbeck. And the great thing is, is if you don't want to wake up at 5.30 Friday morning, you can actually go to our website, renewalministries.net, and any time, day or night, check in on any of the television or radio programs. And people even do these really advanced things like downloading them to their iPods and things like that, you know. I've never done it myself, but people tell me it's doable. I'm sure lots of you do it. And then we also do mission work in about 30 different countries. Uh, we, we, we have a team that just came back from uh, Zimbabwe. We have a team going out to China and another team going out to Vietnam. And we do take people with us on short-term mission trips. So if anybody would ever like to go on a short-term mission trip, again, you could just check out the website, read the reports that are coming in on the different work that the Holy Spirit's doing in different countries. And you can get more information about that if you'd like as well. And the other part of my work is with Sacred Heart Seminary. And I have to tell you, it's a really great seminary. Uh, it's really a healthy seminary. Uh, this past fall, we had more seminarians than we had since the early 1970s. We had 120 seminarians, and uh, there's just a good spirit there, and uh, it's orthodox, but not reactionary. It's right in the line of Vatican II. It's spiritually and pastorally oriented, and it's just a great privilege to be able to teach there. We also have about 350 lay students that are preparing in different ways for different forms of service in the church. Okay, well... The title of the talk is, What is the New Evangelization and Why Bother? And I'm going to talk for a while, and then we'll have a chance for questions right after the talk. Uh, and then we'll have a chance to discuss a little bit in small groups, depending on the time. But um, 
I'm usually not a runaway speaker. I mean, I, I know how to end usually, you know. And uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye on my watch, and I'll try not to go longer than 15 minutes or an hour, okay? And if somebody wants to volunteer to be a timekeeper here in one of these front rows, you can, you can do that. So, so start me in an hour, and, uh, and if I get like 10 minutes near the end of the hour, just go 10 minutes, and I'll start wrapping up. So, okay. Good. Well, where, where did this whole idea about new evangelization come from? Well, John Paul II began to speak about it, you know, shortly after he was elected Pope. But the real foundations of it are in Vatican II. When, when Pope Paul VI and John Paul II and Benedict XVI were, were asked to talk about the fundamental purpose of Vatican II, they would usually describe it like this. Renewal for the sake of evangelization. An interior renewal of the life of the church that would make the church more effective in showing forth Christ to the world. There's a, a text in Gaudium and Spes, number 43, that says it well. It says, although by the power of the Holy Spirit, the church will remain the faithful spouse of her Lord and will never cease to be the sign of salvation on earth, still she is very well aware that among her members, both clerical and lay, some have been unfaithful to the Spirit of God during the course of many centuries. Led by the Holy Spirit, Mother Church unceasingly exhorts her sons to purify and renew themselves so that the sign of Christ can shine more brightly on the face of the church. So renewal for the sake of evangelization and the core of that renewal is a renewal in holiness, a renewal in relationship with God because you can't give what you don't have. And what we mainly are called to give is this relationship with the Lord. So renewal for the sake of evangelization. Now, a funny thing happened right after Vatican II. It's almost like confusion set in and evangelization kind of ground to a halt in different kinds of ways, particularly in the missionary orders. Uh, and there was lots of reasons for, for why this happened. And I won't take too long, but I'll mention a few things. Uh, a lot of Catholics at that time had grown up sort of being pretty, pretty kind of negative about their Protestant brothers and sisters in Christ. They didn't even call them brothers and sisters in Christ oftentimes in those days. And I was just at a conference, and I heard a priest speaking, and he was saying when he was a boy growing up right, at, right around Vatican two times, they snuck into a Presbyterian church one day and immediately went to confession. You know, like that, you know, that, 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 that's just what the atmosphere was like. So when Vatican II, you know, published the decree on Christian unity, uh, it, it was a tremendous advance in terms of saying, hey, we can't stay stuck 400 years ago. We can't blame the Protestants of today for, for rupturing the unity of the body of Christ. Um, this is what they've grown up in. And as a matter of fact, besides our significant differences, we have tremendous amount in common. You know, we have baptism in common, which makes us really members of Christ together, brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's where the term separated brethren came in. Separated, but brethren. And that's really a radically important truth. And many other things we have in common as well that the decree on ecumenism talked about. But what this did for a lot of Catholics was put a question mark around, well, gee, does this still mean that it's important for people to become Catholics? or? Maybe it's okay whatever church you belong to, and maybe we're supposed to dialogue right now and not evangelize. And so just kind of put a little question mark, a little kind of like, what are we really supposed to be doing anyway? What do we really believe anyway? And then there's another Vatican document, the Declaration of Non-Christian Religions. Uh, and, and up until the very eve of Vatican II, all the modern papal encyclicals on mission, including one by John XXIII, would primarily talk about the urgent need to bring the gospel to non-Christian religions because of the defects in those religions, because of idolatry, because of darkness, because of immorality, uh, because of false worship, because of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and, and the urgent need to rescue them from this darkness. In the Declaration of Non-Christian Religions, it didn't deny any of that, although it didn't repeat any of that. And it said, as a matter of fact, there's seeds of the gospel, the seeds of the word in the non-Christian religions. There's, there's things that are there that are good and true and beautiful, 
that are preparation for the gospel. So again, this put a little question mark in people's minds. Does this mean that uh, all roads lead to God? Does this mean that we should be dialoguing with Hindus and Buddhists and so on and so forth? And are we still supposed to evangelize? Is it, is it, is it like an optional extra or does it really matter? Or is salvation still at stake or are there just many roads to God? And so what happened was that missionary orders really began to collapse. And I, I, was, I was just a few years ago in Rome and I was talking to a member of a very famous missionary order from Ireland that's planted the church all over Africa and many other places as well. And he was saying how they haven't had a new vocation for many, many years and they just kind of reformulated their mission statement at their most recent general chapter and they completely eliminated any reference to bringing people to faith and baptism and conversion and their new mission now is caring for the environment, promoting peace and justice and promoting women's rights. All of which are good things, but hey, the United Nations does that too, you know? You know, why would you deny you know, yourself in the radical way that Catholic priests deny themselves in, in the celibate vocation and poverty and religious order uh, to do something that lots of secular NGOs are doing. Like, like Pope Francis said, he says, hey, come on, we're not just another NGO, you know? We've got something really unique and important that, that distinguishes us, and it's the faith. So anyway, all that was happening, all that confusion was happening, and then, of course, the perfect storm of the 60s came along. 1968, student rebellions, demonstrations all over the world, protest against the Vietnam War, you know, make, make love, not war, uh, question authority, you know, just the whole kind of uh, spirit of rebellion and rejection of tradition and authority that, that really became a major powerful influence in culture and universities and still is. And this is what we're dealing with today and the tremendous challenge that we're facing as a Catholic church. And then, of course, there were very famous theologians who gave lectures all around the world, like, like Hans Kung and even, even Karl Rahner, who would say things like, well, Vatican II was a really good start, but it, we got to go a lot further. You know, we really need Vatican III. You know? And so what that did was to make people not too interested in finding out exactly what Vatican II taught, because after all, it didn't go far enough. And so that opened up a whole season of speculation about how far can we go? What's, what else is going to change? Uh, and, and there were a lot of people who were throwing things into the hopper and saying that almost anything can change, and it probably will, and all we need is a less conservative pope and everything will change. So that kind of just put a lot of kind of confusion into the atmosphere. Then in 1975, Pope Paul VI published Evangelii Nuntiandi, Evangelization in Our Day, where he tried to refocus us on the fundamental purposes of Vatican II, renewal for the sake of evangelization. And that apostolic exhortation is still relevant and influential in the uh, lineamenta for the recently concluded Synod of Bishops on the New Evangelization that Monsignor mentioned, in the Instrumentum Laboris, and in some of the final texts. Uh, you'll see quotes from Paul VI in Evangelii Nuntiandi, like, the church exists to evangelize, uh, and, and many other you know, famous quotes as well. Then in 1990, Pope John Paul II published an encyclical called Mission of the Redeemer, Redemptoris Missio, and he begins by saying, there's a lot of confusion today about evangelization. A lot of people are saying the age of missions is over, and we now need to focus just on human development and interreligious dialogue. And he says, I'm writing this encyclical to clear up confusion and to unambiguously state that evangelization is essential, both evangelization to the unevangelized people who have never heard the gospel and a new evangelization directed to those who perhaps are baptized but have drifted away from the faith and aren't living as disciples of Christ. Then in 2000, uh, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith published a document called Dominus Jesus saying, there's a lot of confusion about whether Christ is really necessary and the church is necessary and whether we should still evangelize. And they say, we're writing this document to completely settle this issue. And that nobody is saved apart from Christ and the church. 
and, and there are mysterious ways known to God by which people can come into contact with the saving grace of Christ in the church who have never heard the gospel, but nevertheless, nobody is saved apart from Christ in the church, no matter what their situation is and where they ever lived and past, present, and future. Then in 2007, this will be the last document I'll mention, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith published something called the Doctrinal Note on Evangelization. And it begins by saying, there's a growing confusion about whether we should evangelize. This issue has not been settled. There's still confusion in people's minds that in the back of our minds we think, well, it's nice if people become Christians, but is it really necessary? If it's just nice, well, maybe now and then I'll, you know, invite somebody to church. If it's really necessary, maybe I'll pray and fast and weep before the Lord and make sacrificial efforts to help people awaken to the gospel. Maybe I'll even give my testimony to people I'm talking to at work. Or maybe I'll pass a book around that I just read that could help others come to faith. And maybe what's burning on my heart and mind is the salvation of souls. So is it nice or is it necessary? Now, I think that one of the reasons why this hasn't been settled, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little later. <laughs> I've got some thoughts about why this confusion is still there and what we need to add to the picture to clear it up. And I'll, I'll get to it this morning so you can hear, not just this afternoon when the priests are there. Okay. Okay, let's now talk about what's a good definition of evangelization. Well, there's a broad understanding of evangelization where everything that the church is doing is somehow related to evangelization. But when you say, hey, we're already doing evangelization by everything that we're doing, sometimes there's a, a, a lack of focus and so it's really important to know what's the core of evangelization. Here's a definition from Paul of Six, Evangelium Nuntiandi, section 22. He says, there can be no true evangelization if the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom, and the mystery of Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, are not proclaimed. You can't have the kingdom of God without the king. You can't make the world into a place with kingdom values unless more and more people are coming under the lordship of the king and having their lives transformed and becoming men and women of peace and justice themselves. Uh, my favorite definition is from John Paul II, Redemptoris Missio, section 46. I find this a particularly challenging but also particularly helpful definition. He says, the proclamation of the word of God has Christian conversion. And this is in, in the original, this is in italics, Christian conversion, he's underlining it, as its aim. A complete and sincere adherence to Christ and his gospel through faith. Conversion means accepting by a personal decision the saving sovereignty of Christ and becoming his disciple. So this is section 46 of Redemptoris Missio. You can abbreviate that RM46. Now, when we're trying to make a response to the call to the new evangelization today, we, we tend to think of responding like this. Well, we need to get people back to mass. And we do. And that's a tremendously important, wonderful thing. But there's already people who are going to Mass who have never accepted by a personal decision the saving sovereignty of Christ, who aren't living as his disciple, are picking and choosing from the teachings of Christ which ones they like. There are people sitting in our pews right now, sometimes more with the mind of the world and the spirit of the age than the mind of Christ and the spirit of God. So this would be where new evangelization would come in. We have to help those who are already baptized, maybe they're even coming to church, grow in their understanding 
of what it means to be a Catholic Christian. And because so many of us have been baptized and confirmed at young ages and receiving the Eucharist and maybe haven't grown up in the kind of clear formation that we, we, we need, uh, there's a real need for helping adult Catholics come to an understanding of who Christ is and then inviting them to actually surrender their life to him. That Jesus is not just part of our life, not just an enrichment activity. Going to Mass isn't just like a helpful thing to do, but what we're doing at Mass is a memorial of our redemption. We're remembering that Christ gave his life for us and saved us and has given us his Holy Spirit and is coming again in glory to judge the living and the dead and is sending us on a mission. And so all, all that has to kind of there needs to be like a, an evangelization aspect now to almost everything that we're doing. Another way we sometimes think of responding to the call to a new evangelization is, well, let's get people active in our parish. Well, it may be really helpful to get people active in our parish, but there are currently people who are active in our parish who aren't living as disciples of Jesus Christ, who haven't surrendered their life to him in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a complete surrender, who aren't converted. There are people who just like to be active. There are people who like to be active in the organizations that they belong to. You know, one time I was, I was talking to a priest, and he was saying, well, you know, I feel so discouraged. I'm just preaching to the choir. I said, well, turn the choir into missionaries. Lead the choir to encounter the Lord and be filled with the Spirit and understand the urgency of evangelization so that they can not just be focused on who sings alto and who sings soprano and what music that they're going to choose and who's going to get what parts, but they're going to be looking for how they can reach out and become missionaries. You know, change the choir into missionaries. Lead the choir to a deeper conversion and a deeper participation in the mission of Christ. Or I was talking to another priest who was telling me about this man who was a bookkeeper in the parish. And then he was, he was there for like four or five years and then he quit and he got another job. And, and the pastor ran into him at the grocery store. You know, there aren't you know, so many cooks around anymore, or housekeepers, so you know, sometimes pastors can be found in Kroger's or you know, grocery stores you know, shopping for themselves. You know, a great witness for their people. But anyway, so he ran into the bookkeeper at, at, at the grocery store, and he said, how you doing, Joe? And Joe said, I'm just doing great. You know, I never knew you could have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and, and my friend at my new job kind of invited me to a Bible study, and he helped me to open my life to the Lord, and, and now I'm, 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 I'm a witness for Christ, and I'm reaching out to other people. I never knew that a person could do this if you weren't a priest. I said, well, the, priest, the, the pastor said, well, I mean, I mean, you worked with us for three or four years. Didn't you know that? He says, I wasn't even a Catholic. Nobody ever talked to me about my relationship with the Lord. Nobody ever engaged with me on the level of where I was in my relationship with the Lord. There are people right now sometimes in our parishes who are active in the parish that nobody's ever talked to about the relationship with the Lord and help them to take the next step that could help them grow into even a more committed relationship with the Lord, or maybe coming for the first time, like, like in the case of Joe. Okay, what's, evangel what's the new evangelization? Well, there's lots of different definitions, and over a very long pontificate, you, a pope can use different language at different times, but I think a good guideline is to take the most authoritative highest level authority document since Vatican II, which is a papal encyclical, Mission of the Redeemer, and use that as a definition. So that's section 33, Mission of the Redeemer, where he makes a threefold distinction. First, he says the church needs to recommit itself to primary evangelization, or evangelization ad gentes, to people who have never heard the gospel before. He says, secondly, we need to continue pastoral care to those who are in some kind of living relationship with Christ and the church. But he says, now we're in a new situation, and now we need something 
he calls a new evangelization or re-evangelization. So that's the synonym he uses in the encyclical. New evangelization or re-evangelization. You'll see another talk he gave to Latin American bishops where he says, we're not talking about a re-evangelization as if there was something wrong with the first evangelization. We're not talking about re-baptizing fallen away Catholics. So in that context, he didn't like the word re-evangelization. So you'll see some writings on new evangelization that say it's not re-evangelization, but here it is. And it's not implying that anything was wrong with baptism or it was invalid or you know, people aren't validly connected to the church, but new evangelization or re-evangelization, he says, directed now towards those from traditionally Christian cultures or backgrounds where entire groups of the baptized have lost a living sense of their faith or even no longer consider themselves members of the church and live a life far removed from Christ and his gospel. So... What's new about the new evangelization? The first thing that's new about it is who it's directed to. It's directed to baptized Catholics who aren't living as disciples of Christ. And they can be any range of different relationships to Christ and the church, from periodic mass goers to never darkening the door of a church to Irish Catholics who think what it means to be an Irish Catholic is to drink green beer on St. Patrick's Day. Or, or the, the German, the Italian, and Hispanic equivalents. So the first thing that's new about the new evangelization is who it's directed to. The second thing that's new about the new evangelization is who does it. And this is really like the scary part. Lay people. We're so used to thinking that priests and nuns and Professionals, I know many of you are professionals, do the evangelization, do the work of the church. But you know what it says in Ephesians chapter 4? It says, the risen Christ ascended to his Father and gave leadership gifts to the church. Apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists, not to do the whole work of the church, but to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So the purpose of leadership in the church is not to do the whole work of the church, but to awaken the baptized to their call to holiness and their call to evangelization. When professionals in the church hear about the latest thing coming out of Rome, they say, oh no, another thing they want us to do, new evangelization, We're gonna, how can we possibly add it to everything else that we're already doing? You know, Okay, where's the program? How long is it going to last? A year, two years, three years, you know? Well, it's not a program. There isn't a method that anybody's going to tell you to utilize. There's lots of programs and lots of methods, and it doesn't have a time limit to it. It's actually a way of looking at everything that we're currently doing and assessing the need for an evangelization optic. For example, we're used to thinking of sacramental preparation in a particular way, like a young couple comes preparing for marriage and we do the, the compatibility profile and we talk to them about that and we, we have them go through a couple sessions about this and that and, and, and then we, we have a rehearsal, we tell them where to stand during the ceremony and as you know, a lot of couples coming to get married today aren't living as disciples of Christ, haven't surrendered their life to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, may not be interested in that. And so our marriage preparation now needs to be seen as an evangelization opportunity where we not just do catechesis on marriage and let it kind of like roll off their back like water off a duck's back, but we need to actually engage personally with people in a loving, sensitive, discreet way and talk to them about their relationship with the Lord. Talking about them, about where they've come from in their faith journey or discover that they don't have faith and help them to have it. Maybe pray with them. Maybe suggest that they start praying. Maybe giving them a book, not just about preparation for marriage, but how to live the Christian life. 
So uh, getting together with couples that are not just going to mentoring them in communication and finances and sex, but are actually going to talk to them about how important it is to have Christ at the center of our lives together. So basically, a new optic, a new way of looking at everything we're doing with an evangelization optic. It may not mean more activities or more programs. It may mean reconceiving the things we're already doing with an evangelization optic. Or confirmation. This is tough. This is painful. In, in, in my classes at the seminary with, with youth leaders and DREs and talking to people around the country, people are troubled, vexed in their soul that so many of the young people getting confirmed look at it as the last thing they have to do before they can stop coming to church or are getting dropped off for confirmation class by their parents who themselves aren't going to church. And the parents won't make them go to church anymore if they just get confirmed. This, of course, is such a contradiction to the meaning of the sacrament. You know, the meaning of the sacrament is I'm stepping up. And I'm saying my yes to baptism. I'm saying my yes to following Jesus Christ. I'm saying my yes to being a witness for him. When the result seems to be just the opposite, we need to relook into uh, all of that, all of that preparation and all of that discernment about who's ready to be confirmed and who's not. Uh, I don't have time for this, but St. Thomas Aquinas has some tremendous things about how you can have a valid sacrament, but it's not fruitful because there isn't the faith, there isn't the desire, there isn't the willingness to break from sin that contributes to the fruitfulness of the sacrament. I, on our website, I have some articles on new evangelization on sacramental preparation. So if you go to renewalministries.net and click on free resources, you'll see an article that uh, just got published in, in, a, in a scholarly journal, but it's, it's, it's readable, uh, called Thomas Aquinas and Sacramental Preparation or something like that, which talks about the factors that determine uh, sacramental fruitfulness, not just sacramental validity. Okay, now, right after Vatican II, there's a lot of emphasis on lay involvement, but it tended at that time to focus around, well, let's get lay people more involved in decision making, you know, setting up parish councils, let's get them involved in various kinds of uh, decision making or consultative bodies in the diocese. Uh, let's get them involved as lectors and Eucharistic ministers. And, and all that has an importance. But then, about 20 years later, uh, people began to wake up and say, well, wait a second, only a small number of lay people can serve in this way. The main vocation of a lay person is to be leaven in society, is to be salt and light, is to transform culture. Now, the trouble with that is that most lay people don't have a clue how to be salt and light uh, and what it means to transform culture. And so that's why I think another document of Vatican II has sort of been undiscovered in a certain kind of way is the decree on the apostolate of lay people. And the way that document starts off, it says, Lay people don't have to wait for their pastor or bishop to ask them to do something because they've already been asked by Jesus. High authority has gone right to the individual and said, come follow me. You say, when did that happen? It happened in baptism. But as we know, baptism isn't just a ritual or a ceremony or a membership requirement. It's a sacrament that brings us into living relationship with God. You know, the famous God we read about in the Bible, you know, that one? You know, like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit coming to dwell in us, as, as the seminarians learned from Bishop Quinn's Trinity course. God himself dwelling in us. What's, what's, for example, Jesus doing in us? One of the things he's doing is fiercely loving God the Father. You know, a zeal for his Father's house consumes him. How many times did he say, I'm only saying what I'm hearing from my father. I'm only doing what I, I see my father doing. In another place in scripture, it says, the world must know that I love the father. The world must see that I love the father. 
Jesus wants us to see his fierce love for the Father because he wants to bring us into that love. He wants to share that love with us. He wants to make us one in his love for the Father. And he also wants to make us one in how he receives the Father's love, which is his source of strength. He says, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. What nourishes me, what strengthens me, what sustains me, what gives me fortitude is to do the will of the one who sent me. What else is going on in the heart of Jesus in our heart is a fierce love for human beings. No greater love does a person have than he gives his life for his friends. And Jesus, of course, gave his life for his enemies. And he wants to teach us how to do that. He wants to impart to us a growing supernatural love where we can love even when we're not loved in return. We can love even when the third graders aren't saying they're the greatest teacher they ever had. We can love even when persons say, Father, your homily was too long. I mean, we can, we can love when the couple who are preparing for marriage think it's Greek when we talk to them about their relationship with the Lord. They say, I'm just concerned about the pho photography. I mean, can we get married here or not? The stained glass windows is what we want. I mean, you can love anyway. But it's a particular kind of love. It's a love that's concerned about salvation. Second Corinthians chapter 5, it says, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is in us, appealing through us, that you may be reconciled with God, that you may receive forgiveness for your sins, that you may be incorporated into his body, that you may become part of his life and his mission. Okay, um, hey, what's, somebody tell me what's going on about time. I forgot to look at my watch at the beginning. 25 minutes. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take, this is the authoritative timekeeper, Bishop <laughs> Harrigan, Harrington. Okay, good. I feel a little bit more relaxed, a little more secure now. Okay. The new evangelization is also new in the cultural situation that we're now dealing with. We can't assume a lot of things used to be there, that used to be there are still there, like respect for Christ and the church, understanding of the, of the Ten Commandments, respect for Scripture. It's not there. We're increasingly entering a situation that's more similar to the culture that the early church had to encounter than anything we've known in our lifetime. It's kind of shocking. It's an adjustment. What? People don't like us? I mean, that's, that's, that's a little bit new in, in the way in which it's coming right now. There's a growing hostility to Christ and the church in a culture that more and more willfully and systematically and conscientiously is cutting its ties to Judeo-Christian tradition. In its place, a, a militant hostility to claims that anybody can say anything is true and anything is false, which is insane, but that's where we are. The culture is going insane. It's irrational. It's illogical. But it has a head of steam and a hostility to claims of truth. New, evangeliz new evangelization is also new, as Monsignor mentioned, in order, methods, and expression, open to creative solutions, new ways, new approaches. Okay, now, so far so good, but here, here's the second part. Why bother? Is it nice or is it necessary? Is anything really hanging on our evangelization? Or is virtually everybody going to be saved anyway? Now, if I were to describe how many of our fellow Catholics look at the world today, perhaps most by this point, I'd describe it like this. Broad and wide is the way that leads to heaven, and almost everybody is going that way. But narrow is the door and difficult the road that leads to hell, and hardly anybody's going that way. Now, what's wrong with this picture? It's reversed. It's the exact opposite of what Jesus, how, how Jesus himself describes the situation. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. What did Jesus say? Broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction. Many are traveling that way. Narrow is the door that leads to life, difficult the road, and few are who are finding it. 
holy Toledo, to use a neutral expression that doesn't involve either Michigan or Minnesota. <laughs> holy Toledo. How did we ever get to the point of believing as gospel truth something that's just the opposite of what the gospel says? How did we ever get there? Little by little. That confusion I was telling you about, that, that open-ended, who knows what's going to change, that, that question mark that got put over evangelization by not understanding accurately enough the Vatican documents. And then our own flesh. You know, what it says in Scripture is people will look out for, te for teachers to tell them what they want to hear. It's easier to believe that everybody is going to be saved. It's easier. It's troubling. It's challenging. It changes our life to believe that maybe we need to do something to contribute to people's salvation. Matthew 7 isn't an isolated text. In fact, the whole message of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is about this awesome choice that God is presenting to man's freedom. And this is a mystery of freedom. The Lord is looking for friendship. The Lord is looking for love. What this is all about is heading towards the marriage feast of the Lamb. And we know that in a human marriage, if there's any compulsion, if there's any force used, we immediately annul the marriage. You can't have a valid marriage without the free gift of the two parties one to another. That's true in our relationship with God. The Lord is not looking for slaves. He's not looking for robots. He's not looking for... He's looking for the free choice of people to freely give themselves to him in love. And that means it's risky. Because where there's freedom, there's the possibility of a yes, but there's also the possibility of a no. And the Lord does everything he can right up to the door of forcing, but stopping short, to give people all the help they need to say yes. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The hound of heaven is, is making his rounds. The, the Lord is knocking on doors. But there has to be the opening of the door. There has to be the yes in order to be, in order to be saved. Luke chapter 13. People point blankly ask Jesus, will there be few in number who are saved? And Jesus didn't say, oh, come on, chill, guys. I mean, you're just taking too seriously Jewish hyperbole. Don't you know your literary forms? <laughs> I don't really mean that stuff. I mean, you're, you're taking it too seriously. I mean, that's just a metaphor. I mean, come on, come on, chill. It's going to be okay. No, what did, what did he say? He said, try very hard to enter by the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter, but will not be able to. And how many times does Jesus tell us parables about the wise virgin and the foolish virgin and the bridegroom coming and the door shutting? And some could enter and some couldn't? How many times do we read parables of the, the final judgment where the Lord sends forth his angels to separate the weeds and the wheat. And today, the Feast of John the Baptist. The Gospel of Matthew. Other, the other Gospels as well. John the Baptist introduces Jesus as the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And the one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit. And even now, the axe is at the root of the tree. His winnowing fan is in his hand. And he's about to thresh out the threshing floor and separate the wheat from the chaff and throw the chaff into the fire. So that was, that was John the Baptist. Jesus would never say anything like that. Fast forward to those absolutely profound, 
high priestly chapters where Jesus is sharing his art with his disciples in John's Gospel, and he makes his own, the very language, the very imagery of John the Baptist where he says, those who are united to the vine and are bearing fruit will be pruned so they'll bear more fruit, but those who are not bearing fruit will be cut off and thrown into the fire. The separation of the human race based on our response to the grace of God is an absolutely consistent message of scripture from the beginning to the end. Thomas Aquinas, when he was meditating in the third part of the Summa on the, the crucifixion, he says, on the hill of Calvary, you saw a foretaste or a foreshadowing of the final judgment. The humble thief who recognized the holiness of Jesus and turned to him with faith and love, heard Jesus say to him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. The other thief mocked and blasphemed and hardened his heart. Thomas says, you see already the separation of the human race foreshadowed right on the hill of Calvary. Now, we know that people who are currently on the Broadway heading to destruction don't have to stay in that way. And that's where evangelization comes in. We also know that God wills the whole human race to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants people to make it. But there has to be the yes. You know, sometimes people talk about, well, God is so merciful, and I didn't kill anybody. We're going to be okay. Well, murder is just one of a long list of things that can exclude people from the kingdom of God. And already, even in the early church, there was deception and confusion about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says, don't let anybody deceive you. The immoral will not enter the kingdom of God. Now, what do us Catholics believe about Holy Scripture? Again, Vatican II. De, Ver, uh, De Verm. Section 11. It says, everything asserted by the sacred authors should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit and to teach firmly, faithfully, and without error those truths which God wished consigned to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. That's why Vatican II and, and Pope Benedict and his Jesus of Nazareth series and in, in the, in the uh, apostolic exhortation that came after the sin of the word of God can talk about we need to treasure the word in a way analogous to what we treasure the body and blood of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Don't let anybody deceive you. The immoral will not enter the kingdom of God. The fornicator, the adulterer, those engaged in homosexual sex, the idolater, the robber, the thief, the miser, will not enter the kingdom of God. Unless people repent of serious sin, they're excluding themselves from the kingdom. Now, if you talk about serious sin to many Catholics today, they don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you mean like uh, pollution or global warming? Or is that, is that what you're talking about? Because they've heard that God doesn't care so much about these little personal things. It's just those big world issues that he's concerned about. That's a deception. That, that's not what Jesus says. That's not what the apostles say. That's not what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says. Already, from the very first days, there was a satanic attempt to confuse people about the truth about God, the truth about ourselves, the truth about right and wrong, the truth about what leads to heaven and what leads to hell. In, in, in the second letter of Timothy, it says that the doctrines of demons will be infiltrated into the church through plausible liars. So the spiritual warfare and spiritual deception, even within the church, and that's why it's so important that we're so grounded in the word of God and scripture as it comes to us in the tradition of the church and, and the current magisterium. 1 Corinthians 6 isn't an isolated text. You'll find almost identical list in Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, and Revelation 22. 
Not only that, you'll find Jesus saying, you've heard it said, don't kill. I say to you, don't be angry with your brother. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I say, don't you voluntarily engage yourself in lustful thoughts in your heart. I'm not talking about things that flip through your mind that you reject, but don't receive it into you. But he says, unless your holiness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of God. The Lord's looking for an interior renewal. Or the book of Hebrews says, strive for that holiness without which nobody will see God. You don't drift into the kingdom of God by going along with the culture. Jesus is the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent bear it away. The violence of humbling ourselves and receiving forgiveness, the violence of conversion, of repentance, of baptism. Now people say, sometimes when I'm talking about this, hey Ralph, I, I know scripture says that. I know the church used to teach that. But haven't you heard that Vatican II changed all that? Well, I, I have heard that. But you know what? It's not true. Now listen to this. Lumen Gentium, Section 16, Constitution of the Church. What does it say? Those who through no fault of their own, that do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and moved by grace, trying their actions to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience, these two may achieve eternal salvation. So, People who haven't heard the gospel do have the possibility of being saved, only through Christ and the church, because they can come into some mysterious contact with them under certain conditions. What are the conditions? That it's not their fault that they haven't heard the gospel, that nevertheless they're seeking God and want to know who this mysterious God is that you can perceive through the creation, Romans chapter 1. The third condition is that they're trying to live according to the light of conscience, assisted by grace. Nobody ever can be saved except by grace through faith. That's a doctrinal teaching of the church. Everybody has an instinct for right and wrong. Romans chapter 2 says people will be judged on the basis of the light they have. But we can't live according to our light of conscience adequately without help from God. And what this, what this section here of Lumen Gentium 16 is saying is that God will give help to every human being who are not at fault for not hearing the gospel and really want to know who he is and want to live according to the light of their conscience and they possibly could be saved. Now people hear this and they make a huge leap. They say, oh, I'm really glad to hear that. I don't have to worry about people now. And they make a huge jump from the possibility to probability to virtual certainty. And they can only do that because they haven't read the last three sentences. I'm almost speechless about this. In almost everything that's been written theologically about this issue, there's a total ignoring of the last three sentences of Lumen Gentium 16. I was even down in Orlando in, in January for a seminar for bishops on the new evangelization. There were about 40 bishops and archbishops there. And one of the days, the uh, Office of Readings was the reading from Lumen Gentium 16. And it included the first part, but it left out the last three sentences. What are them? Ten minutes to go. I'm okay. We're going to make it. Thank you, Bishop. Here's the last three sentences. But, very often, deceived by the evil one, human beings have become foolish in their thinking and have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship the creature rather than the creator. Therefore, to procure the glory of God and the salvation of all these, the church, mindful of the Lord's command, preached the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, is zealous to carry out its mission of evangelization. So what the church is saying here, none of this happens in a neutral environment. Every human being is in a spiritual battle. The world, the flesh, and the devil are real, and they're tremendous impediments to cooperating with the grace of God. They're tremendous impediments to seeking God and desiring to live according to the light of conscience. 
all of us, weakened by original sin, have disordered inclinations, whatever they are. And it's so easy to give into them without the help of Christ in the church. All of us are subject to brainwashing by a culture that's increasingly drifting away from God. All of us are subject to believing false things about right and wrong. All of us have become gradually accustomed to laughing to immorality, laughing at immorality, laughing, laughing at blasphemy, laughing at Christians in the most popular television programs, becoming accustomed to accepting immorality as okay, as virtuous. All of us are impacted by that. And then, of course, Ephesians chapter 6 says, our battle isn't against just flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. And, and it talks about how we need to really guard ourselves with spiritual armor, the, the, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of holiness, the, our feet shod with the, with the gospel of peace. And most importantly, the shield of faith that extinguishes the flaming darts of the evil one. Every single one of us are having things shot at us all the time. Temptations, uh, deceptions, uh, storing up our disordered passions. All of us are being shot at by the evil one all the time, taking advantage and working in harmony with the world and the flesh. Many of our fellow Catholics don't know they're in a spiritual battle and are sitting ducks to being picked off by the evil one. If you don't know you're in a battle, the odds are you've been captured and you're already in a prisoner of war camp and you may already have been enlisted in the enemy's army without even knowing it because you're parroting the lies. You've had a reversal happen in your mind and you're parroting the lies. That's why we really need this new evangelization so we can awaken our baptized Catholics to the whole biblical worldview about what the truth is about reality. The shortness of life and only one thing is necessary. And there's only two destinations, heaven and hell. And there really is a heaven and there really is a hell and it really matters what you believe and how you behave. Okay. Um, finally... The priest will get some of this this afternoon. Okay. <laughs> Lumen Gentium 14. We were talking about people who haven't had a chance to hear the gospel. What about people who have had a chance to hear the gospel? What about baptized Catholics? This is what the Constitution of the Church says, section 14. He is not saved, however, who, though part of the body of the church, does not persevere in charity, supernatural charity. He remains indeed in the bosom of the church, but as it were, only in a bodily manner and not in his heart. All the church's children should remember that their exalted status is to be attributed not to their own merits, but to the special grace of Christ. If they fail, moreover, to respond to that grace in thought, word, and deed, not only shall they not be saved, but they will be the more severely judged. It's not enough just to go to church or be active in the parish. We need to be living a life of grace. And if we're not, our baptism avails us nothing. Not only will we not be saved, but will we be the more severely judged. Now, we need to tell people the truth. We really do. It's hard. It's hard. We all have family. We all have relatives who are living lifestyles that Jesus says we'll exclude them from the kingdom of God. It's really hard to think about this. It's really hard to embrace it. But we need to because it's the truth. And it's like somebody goes to a doctor, and they're actually dying of cancer. And the doctor says, everything's OK. Just take an aspirin. It's malpractice. We can't be guilty of spiritual malpractice. We have to tell people the truth. Because only if they know the truth will they have the possibility of being healed their soul being healed, their life being saved, their sins being forgiven, their mind being renewed, as it says in Romans chapter 12. Finally, there's a lot of talk about God's mercy, right? And, and, and none of us can, can express adequately the greatness of the mercy of God. 
And the Lord even sent St. Faustina as an apostle of divine mercy. And I say divine mercy chaplet is fabulous. But even fabulous things like the divine mercy message can be taken by the evil one and used for his purposes. And what's happened is only part of the divine mercy message has been communicated clearly. Jesus told St. Faustina, now is the time for mercy. I'm sending you to prepare my people for the second coming and the final judgment. And I'm also telling you that despite my bitter passion, souls are rejecting my mercy and are being lost forever. Section 965 of her diary. In section 741 of her diary, she says, the Lord had me taken by angels on a tour of hell. It was vast and there were many people there. And the Lord said, I want you to write this down so nobody can ever say that hell doesn't exist and that there's no one there. You can, you can look it up, section 741. I'll, I'll do more about that later this afternoon. The mercy of God is overwhelmingly generous, but it's not automatically applied. We have to open the door. We have to, there has to be a yes to mercy. There has to be an acknowledgement of our need for mercy. There has to be, we have to stop hiding our sins and allow the, the precious blood of Christ to forgive us in the sacrament of reconciliation. There has to be a response to mercy for mercy to become effective in a person's life. Okay, well, let's pray just for a minute. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you for the clarity of your revelation, the consistency of your teaching. We thank you for giving us a chance to meditate on your word, even though it's hard, even though it's challenging. And we ask you to give us the wisdom about know how to apply this in practice in our own lives and in the lives of those that we serve. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's have a little time now for, first of all, any kind of clarifying questions like, did I hear you right when you said this? Or do you really mean that? Or uh, I'm not clear how this goes with that. Let's just have a little time for some clarifying questions. Maybe somebody could bring a, a mic around to somebody who Make it easier for people to, uh, good. I think somebody over here would like to say, say something. Jonathan, somebody's over here. Why don't you go to them so they don't have to walk up front, yeah. I loved everything that you said. When you were talking about charity, that we had to um, be living in charity, the problem when I talk with other people is that how they're defining charity. If you define charity their way, then anything they want to do is just fine. How do you handle very, that? Very, very good question, very good point. It's really being used here in a technical way that describes living in the grace of God, not just being nice to people, but actually living in God's grace and operating out of the grace of God with supernatural love. I mean, it should express itself in mercy to our neighbor and you know, service and all that kind of stuff, but it also requires the, the relationship of holiness to the Lord and righteousness and rejecting sin. And that's taking that supernatural love, they feel that supernatural love still means that they can do anything they want to do because you will be merciful and you will be loving them. Who, who will be merciful? Who? The church is not being merciful to them because they're not allowing them to live the lifestyle that they want. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I hope that some of the other things I said would have contributed to that, that, you know, the the church wants to extend the mercy of Christ. It doesn't have its own mercy to extend. It extends the mercy of Christ. And the mercy of Christ is, is an invitation to repentance and faith and baptism. And in order to receive that mercy, you need to like acknowledge your need for it and, and repent of your sins and live a new life. Yeah. So yeah, this, 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 this mercy thing is a big deception right now. People just are saying, God's so merciful and I'm not a murderer, so everything's okay. 
and that's just not true. Now, we shouldn't take like the bull in the china ship shop approach to this, like, you know, barging in with our Bible in hand and kind of, you know, doing it. But, but like Paul says, I've warned you with tears, please. You know, like, like we, we need to be on our knees and, and weeping for souls and, 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 and compassion and, and, and sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. I mean, we need to ask the Holy Spirit how to begin here. And we maybe shouldn't begin right away with this, that, or the other thing, but just see how the Lord wants to lead us. Uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just say, look, don't, don't, don't kill me. I'm just the messenger, but look at what Jesus says. I just would like to ask you to please think about what Jesus says and, 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 and just see what implications this really has for your life. Or, or look, what, look what scripture says here. It says people who do these things will enter the kingdom of God. And I want you to enter the kingdom of God, you know? I don't want to be separated from you forever. I want you to enter the kingdom with me. And look what it says. I just have a quick one. How do you approach people who believe that they just do good, they're, they're fine? I mean, because otherwise they think you're judging them. So yeah. how do you really approach them? Yeah. Um, there's, there's, a thi there's things you have to put together um, in order to get a clear picture of what, what life the Lord is asking us to, to live. There's the famous judgment scene in Matthew's Gospel, where those who feed the hungry and et cetera do the works of mercy are surprised to discover they were doing it to Christ and will be enter into the kingdom. And there's those who didn't do that who will be excluded from the kingdom. So that's one text that we need to take into account. But uh, John chapter 3, it says, we, we tend to forget the gravity of the sin of unbelief. Uh, Father Francis Martin, a scripture scholar, says, you know, the greatest sin is not to believe in the one that God has sent. And when Jesus said, people, people ask Jesus, what's the work we're supposed to do? He says, the work you're supposed to do is believe in the one he sent. And in John chapter 3, you know, there's a famous text about God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that those who believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. People skip over the perish part. They suddenly skip over the belief part, and they just stay with the God loves everybody part. Well, God's love comes to us in the particular shape and form of Jesus. That's where the love is. That's where the mercy is. And the way we access that love and mercy is through faith in Jesus. And that brings eternal life. If you read on to the next verse, it says, those who believe, Jesus says those, chapters of verse 17 and 18, John chapter three, says those who believe are already have eternal life. Those who refuse to believe are, are condemned. Or, John, you know, uh, the, very, the very last verse in John chapter 3, it says, those who believe have eternal life. Those who don't believe are under the wrath of God. So the, the evil of not believing in the one that God has sent. And, 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 or like in 1 John 1, it talks about, you know, not, you're calling God a liar, not, not to believe the testimony that he's giving to his own son. You know, so it's sort of like the gravity of not submitting our mind and heart and will to the one who's being revealed to us as the source of, of, of salvation. So there's a lot of things that go into the whole picture. Yeah. Um, um, what I wanted to say is that what I've found in conversations with people is they don't value scripture. So for me to reference scripture, uh, D is lost on them. Um, so I can understand the scripture being a foundation for me and how I live my life, but what are some other tools in which one can use, you know, until they get to that point where they, scripture has any value? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, I see you have a diocesan office of evangelization and apologetics. And apologetics for a while was focusing just on answering the charges of Protestants against us. But now they need to turn to fundamental questions like this, like how do we know anything anyway? How do we know that God has spoken to us? Uh, how do we know this is a reliable account of who Jesus is and what he said? Why do we believe it's inspired? Why do we believe Jesus is the son of God? You know, so there's, there's good answers and good approaches to all those 
fundamental apologetic questions. And this is the whole natural law thing. But again, a lot of people say, well, I don't see it. You know, you say, well, look, I mean, can't you see that a man and woman's body are geared in a particular way, you know, to have babies? And that's, that's what this is all about. And they, they'll say, no, I don't see it, you know. <laughs> you know, so there's a veil. And, and we got to kind of ask the Holy Spirit to help us know what, what would be the key that would unlock this particular veil. I might, I might tell you uh, a few of the resources that are available here. I didn't talk about this book at all, but if you buy one book, this would be the one. It's called The Fulfillment of All Desire, a guidebook for the journey to God based on the wisdom of the saints. It took me 10 years to write, and basically it's the best wisdom the church has about how to grow in union with the Lord, how to, how to really surrender to the work of grace in our hearts to transform us. And a lot of us hit different plateaus in our spiritual life or kind of places of stagnation and kind of start coasting on the prayer of the community and we're kind of get kind of maybe self-satisfied about where we are, maybe a little lukewarmness or fatigue or whatever. And if we, if we know the Lord has more for us but don't know how to go about it or if, if we feel like maybe this is all I have, there's, there's really more. The Lord just wants to draw us in an ever deeper union with himself, ever deeper conformity to his will, dwell in us ever more freely and fully. And it's, it's a longer book, but it's easy to read. I tried to put it in an orderly, clear way, the best wisdom the Catholic Church has from the doctors of the church. So that, that's available. There's also a, a study guide that can go with it. And there's also a 13-week DVD series called The Fulfillment of All Desire. BWTN asked me to do a 13-week series presenting it uh, in, in a video place. And a lot of people are using this as a way of evangelizing. You know, everybody's interested in spirituality today, you know? So say, hey, let's get together and watch a, a video on spirituality, you know? And, you know, come on, all you New Agers, come on, all you crystal rubbers, you know? And, and, and you know, and it's a way of reaching out and, and, and helping people awaken to who the Lord is and what he wants to do in our life. So that, that's, that's available, too. If you want more depth in what I was talking about this morning, uh, this would be the book, Will Many Be Saved? What Vatican II Actually Teaches and Its Implications for the New Evangelization. If you, I deal with some of the theological theories that are confusing things and things like that. If you want less depth, I have a little booklet called New Evangelization, Why Bother? That we're actually giving away free right now on our website. Uh, like I think it's like 19 pages. So if you go to renewalministries.net and click on free booklet and you want less depth, uh, but a, a concise summary of what I was talking about here today, that, that's available for free. And then just recently, we put together uh, a seven DVD, a seven talk DVD series, helping people open themselves up to the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, not connected to any particular movement, not necessarily connected to a prayer group, but just trying to take the wisdom that we've learned over the years about how people can personally experience a new Pentecost in their life. Because one of the things the Pope's call for, he says, we need to have a new Pentecost in order to have a new evangelization. Uh, the disciples before Pentecost were very different from the apostles after Pentecost. So people really need to open themselves more to the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is a way of doing it, a seven-week uh, DVD series. You can do it over, over a weekend or a day or once a week and things like that. So. There's also some CD albums, you know, when you're driving the four-hour distance from one end of the diocese to the other, you want to you wanna have Catherine of Siena drive along with you, and I'll explain her fabulous teachings about the spiritual life, or you want Therese of Lezou, or Bernard of Clairvaux, or John of the Cross, so those are available in CD form, too. Okay, well, um, why don't we, how much time do we have for small groups, Todd? Do we have a little time for people to interact around the table? Do we, how much time? Or, or do we have time? No, no time. Okay, well, over lunch, <laughs> over lunch, kind of talk with each other about what you heard, uh, what you felt like was helpful, what you felt was challenging, and just help each other to absorb and deal with what, what we were talking about. Okay.